bom dia a todos, boa noite para a nossa palestrante lá na Austrália, que é de noite lá. É um grande prazer começar os nossos trabalhos desse semestre, né, do primeiro semestre de 2021, com todos vocês. Eu espero que vocês aproveitem a nossa disciplina, nós estamos nos esforçando para trazer palestrantes de várias partes do planeta, com diferentes assuntos, porque vocês sabem que a ideia dessa disciplina é abrir cabeças, é mostrar novidades sobre diferentes temas. É, eu acho que é uma grande oportunidade para a gente aprender. Eu queria inicialmente pedir desculpas, porque a gente teve alguns probleminhas é, de comunicação, da minha parte, na verdade, é, confundindo dois seminários diferentes. Nosso próximo será segunda-feira, e não na quarta, eu achei que era nessa segunda que passou. Né? Então, já peço desculpas e agradeço muito a paciência de vocês, mas a gente vai se ajustando né, ao longo do semestre. Hoje a gente vai ter uma convidada muito especial, que é a doutora Patrícia é, Just, Justé, Just, e eu Just. vou, apresentar, vou apresentar esse seminário junto com o professor César, que é especialista no tema que ela vai é, ministrar para a gente hoje. And so I want to thank you very much, Patricia, Patricia for accepting our invitation and be available for uh, doing this uh, lecture to us. So thank you very much, Patricia. And Cesar, please, can you present our guest? <laughs> thank you for that, Professora Andrea. Nice to meet you, to have you with, in, in our university, even virtually, Dr. Patricia Yusuf. Thank you for coming, even uh, virtually. Um, Dr. Patricia Youssef works at the University of Melbourne. And uh, his, uh, she, her uh, model, main model is a zebra fish. She's working with neurobiology, uh, try to understand the uh, regeneration of neuronal system with the focus on visual system. Uh, student candidate genes, genes involved with a regeneration of neuronal system. Uh, then uh, uh, I would like to thanks for your presence, presence here and uh, feel free to start your talk. Thank you again for your presence in our university. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Ricardo and Cesa, very much for the, for the invitation to speak here today. I'm very excited. Um, so today I'll be talking about my favorite model system, the zebra fish that I use in my lab. And instead of talking in detail about a big project, I thought for this audience, it would be nice to just show you a few snapshots of the different types of research and projects and how we can use zebra fish to answer different types of questions. The common uh, question or interest in the lab is to understand the vertebrate central nervous system. We're actually interested in the human central nervous system, but unfortunately humans cannot be manipulated um, as much as we'd like. And so we're using the zebra fish as a vertebrate model system to understand processes that also happen in humans. And so the central nervous system is composed of the brain, the spinal cord, and also the eye, a neurostructure in the eye, which my lab focuses on. We're interested in understanding the genetics that drive the normal development of the CNS, regeneration, as Cesar already mentioned, and to use the fish as a disease modeling to understand what goes wrong um, when there are mutations. Here on the right-hand side, you can see a diagram showing the genetic conservation. And I just want to highlight that across the different vertebrates, including zebrafish, human, mouse, and chicken, over 10 and a half thousand genes are actually conserved. And many of these are involved in a lot of the developmental processes of making a vertebrate. And so they're the same between all of these species. 
And so when we look at fundamental processes like development of the central nervous system, most of the genes that are involved in making this beautiful system in humans are also used by zebrafish. To highlight why we choose the zebrafish um, compared to other models, we use it to complement mouse and other models and to provide slightly different um, research answers. So some of the advantages we make use for is the fact that zebrafish lay hundreds of eggs. And so we can easily um, perform studies on genetically um, on the same clutch. So we have a control always. Because they develop outside of the mother, we can inject them very easily. This is a yolk injection at the one cell stage. And we can use this to inject RNA and DNA. We can use this to use the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to make mutants. And we can then follow what happens after we manipulate genes. This video on the right shows the development in the first 19 hours of the zebrafish. And it highlights that development is very fast. And again, this helps us to identify the phenotype without having to wait too long. So you can see that after a series of rapid cell divisions and now cell migration, before the first day is over, actually the vertebrate plan of the fish has already been established. So you can see here the head, the tail, and this is the eye primordium, which is already starting before 24 hours. By three days, the visual neurons and the synapses are formed. And by five days, the fish use their vision to actually catch their food. So between injecting on a Monday, by Friday, you could already see any phenotypes in the central nervous system. We also use and generate transgenic lines where we can drive fluorescent proteins um, behind a promoter of a gene we're interested in. So by using live imaging, we can then see exactly when a gene turns on and what, how that changes the cell's behavior. So here's a transgenic line from collaborators in England showing three different colors in, in different neurons in the eye. I will talk more about um, behavioral tests we've set up. And the other big advantage is that zebrafish regenerate every organ study to date, whether it's muscle, um, brain, eye, fin. Um, here is an example from a study I won't talk about today, but this is a study I was involved in with colleagues looking at spinal cord regeneration where we completely cut the spinal cord of a fish. And this is two days after. You can see the fish is paralyzed. The front moves a little bit, but the back as expected because there's no neurons um, cannot move and cannot swim. This is the same fish three weeks later. So as you can see, we cannot distinguish this from an uninjured one. It has completely regenerated. Um, so it's a beautiful model to understand why, even though the same genes are used during development, some vertebrates can regenerate and whether we can make mammals and humans maybe reuse their, their genes as well. The model system, I'm, the model organ I'm looking at is mainly the eye. So this is a cross section through a human eye. And we're looking at the nerve cells found at the back of the eye that are involved in vision. So that's called the retina. The reason we look at the eyes, because again, as you will see with our behavioral test, we can easily test the visual performance. And also the structure is actually much simpler than the rest of the brain. There's only five main types of neurons and they're found in these beautiful layers. So this is the human retina. And this is a section through a zebrafish retina showing that we have the same types organized in the same manners. So we've got light sensing neurons um, at the back of the eye and then interneurons. And finally, at the bottom, we've got the neurons that form the optic nerve to go to the brain. Today, I will very briefly show you some data, again, to give you an idea of the breadth of uh, research we can do with zebrafish, following these four main themes. The first is to look at how these different nerve cells are generated during development and how we use the tools in zebrafish to look at the function of genes um, in a way that cannot be done in other model systems. So again, we're complementing some of the work that's already been done in parallel in um, other labs in mammals. We have also generated, um, to my knowledge, the, the world's first zebrafish phenotype pipeline 
that allows us to directly correlate what happens when we have a genetic mutation uh, within cells, within the organ, within the function, as well as within the behavior of this organ. So the individual techniques are used um, across labs, also in mammals, but we've now been able to combine that in a pipeline to um, assess gene mutations all the way through to the behavioral phenotype that you might see in humans. Uh, thirdly, I will talk briefly about our approaches looking at neuroregeneration and how that might um, mirror some of the developmental things we see. And finally, I will talk about a research direction that has been established by a new postdoc, well, not so new actually anymore, Pauline, who joined the lab last year, where um, she's established a new direction in the lab looking at antioxidants and how they can be used for, visual, for, for treating visual disorders. So in terms of neurodevelopment, the aspects we focus on on zebrafish are to look at the life timing of genes and then to understand when, where, and how they play their role. So we do that using the transgenic lines. This is a developing eye here. This is a zoomed out region. And again, using the transgenic lines where we have genes of interest that we know are expressed in very specific neurons driving fluorescent proteins. So you can see um, as the movies play, that we can see individual cells turn on various genes. We can see whether they express both genes or just one or just the other. And we can follow development to see how that influences what type of cells they are. So using this kind of approach, um, I was in, a, in my postdoc in the UK where I started working with zebrafish, able to show that inhibitory neurons that were already known to need to require this particular gene um, it's a pancreas transcription factor to be made. I was able to show that the role it played and the timing it played was to turn on in a lineage that would usually give rise to other excitatory neurons to make them change their fate into different types of inhibitory neurons. So we now know that neurons from a single progenitor, we know that they're all made from a single progenitor, but we now know with um, colleague studies in combination, that there are three types of progenitors that make the three excitatory neurons. And then my favorite gene that I started looking at is able to change their fate into some of these inhibitory neurons. We combine this live imaging by genetic uh, functional knockout and overexpression studies. So again, just to show you um, very briefly, the main results from our paper, um, we have a transgenic line in which all the cells that usually turn on PTF1A, so those that activate the promoter, will make green fluorescent protein. And because it makes inhibitory neurons, we can see at five days, oops, in a cross section, that we have green cells in the two inhibitory layers. These are horizontal cells, these are amacrine cells. So that's the wild type. When we knock down PTF1A, and again, we do this by injecting the X, and we can check five days later. We can see that uh, we know that it's important for inhibitory neurons, but we can see by this combination that the cells have not disappeared. So they don't undergo apoptosis. Um, they don't stop developing. They have made different fates. And that fits with the network I showed you previously, where we can say if PTF is there, it makes an inhibitory cell. If it's missing, it still has an alternative fate to uh, generate. Similarly, when we overexpress PTF1A, and we're able to do this in a way that we only overexpress it in a few cells, so we know that it's acting inside the cell or cell autonomously, we can see that we're able to make those cells make more inhibitory neurons. So in the control, when we're driving it, in this case, we're driving it with a um, promoter that is in a gene that usually makes a lot of ganglion cells. These are the ones that have the optic nerve to the brain. When we overexpress PTF1A in those cells, it's enough to turn them into amacrine cells. So through these studies, uh, we and others have shown that neural fate in development is often one or another choice rather than one or death. And this is very interesting because if you now have a disease where you're missing inhibitory neurons or ganglion cells, it might be the matter of manipulating that one gene 
to make one of the cell types into another as a therapeutic strategy. So using this approach, um, we have a study where we're looking at a gene called NR4A2. Again, if you look for this online, you will see there's 500 papers or probably more now, um, including in mammalian studies, showing that it's important for dopaminergic neurons. We also know that in inherited Parkinson's disease, where you're missing dopaminergic neurons, this is one of the key genes that's mutated if it's um, famil familial inheritance. We've made a transgenic line so we can again see these cells. We can stain these with the enzyme that makes dopaminergic um, neurons. And the first thing we notice, which going back to some of the mouse papers, we also find is that the expression of this is not enough to make the cells dopaminergic. So it's required because we've made a CRISPR mutant and the cells disappear, but it's not enough. Um, so we, we're interested as others are what else these cells need. Um, and this kind of work is important because people are using human um, induced pluripotent stem cells, putting in genes such as NR4A2 to make dopaminergic neurons and then injecting them into um, mouse models of Parkinson's to be able to replace the missing cells. So it might be that NR4 it itself is not enough and we need some other stuff. So those are the kind of approaches we use in development um, where we knock out or overexpress genes to complement other models to actually understand when is the gene expressed, what happens to the cells, what happens when we put it in or take it away. And the beauty of the zebrafish is that it, uh, we can track this with live imaging throughout early development until the, the visual system is developed. The second um, area is this visual pipeline I've been talking about. And the point of this pipeline was initially to um, use the zebrafish to screen through the bulk of human genome-wide association studies. So these are studies where we compare affected and uninfected individuals. This could be a disease or a particular a phenotype trait. And we get often because of the statistical power and the thousands of people involved, we get lots of new hits of genes that could be novel candidates linked to a disease or to a phenotype. Um, but how those genes work mechanistically, again, is obviously hard to test in humans. So we use the zebrafish, we can generate mutants or use those injections to knock them out. And we wanna see how that affects um, protein expression at the subcellular level, within the eye, at the physiological level, so visual function and at the behavioral level. And so um, a master's student who's now a PhD student established these in the lab for the first time in zebrafish. Um, so here's an example where we just did one of our injury models where we get rid of these inhibitory neurons because we wanted to see if the pipeline would be sensitive enough to pick this up. And you can see these are all five day old sections through the eye. Again, this is the lens of the retina, the neural structure. This is the wild type where we have red inhibitory neurons and we are stained in this case, we're looking for subcellular phenotypes for a synaptic marker and this is the synaptic layer. We can see with the injury, which we can, we have a transgenic line where we can add a chemical into the water and we can um, cause the same injury in about 200 fish. And we can see that we, uh, Jahang found two different injury types. One that was missing these red cells, but still had the synaptic layer and one that was missing the red cells and was missing the synaptic layer. When he looked at, the, when he looked at this subcellular phenotype, he was able to show that um, in both cases, the number of inhibitory neurons were gone. The retinal size was only infected, affected in this one. So this one still had the normal layers. Um, and if he looked at the thickness of the synaptic layer, he could see that the injury type two was more severe, but both of them were significantly smaller than the wild type. So now we wanted to know, so my lab, usually, my experience is more this anatomy but we wanted to know how that now correlates at the other levels. So Jahang's also optimized a zebrafish larval electroretinography model. This is a way in which we can record 
the performance of visual neurons. And so this is the setup. It's actually a mouse setup that we've optimized for larval zebrafish. The fish is too small. Um, when we zoom in, we can see that we have a wet sponge with a five day old fish. This ball provides a light stimulus and we have a reference electrode under the wet sponge. So what happens is that when the light flashes, you will get a response of the retinal neurons and you re can record that. And because um, the different neurons act in sequence, the timing shows you which neurons are responding. So you get an electro um, retinal gram out. So using the same injury model, he was able to show um, where if we look at black, this is what a control wild type larva looks like. Again, the, the time at the bottom. And so the different waves show different neurons. And on the Y axis, we have increasing light intensity in which we basically as expected, just see the same with a bigger response. So if we focus on the biggest one here, which is the um, brightest light flash, we can see that we have a small dip. This is the light sensing photoreceptors. And then we've got inner retinal neurons, which are in, oops, which include the bipolar and inhibitory neurons that we've ablated, um, giving this B wave. We can see that in the injury type one, which wasn't so bad in the anatomy, we get a reduction. In the injury type two, we actually get a reversal of the signal. Uh, and this makes sense because we're getting rid of inhibitory neurons. We can pull out different um, measurements, whether it's timing, delay, size. Here I'm showing the one that changed the most, which is this amplitude of this B wave. And we can see that in the control it increases with increasing light intensity. In the injury it does, but not as much. And in the injury type two, it gets worse to a bigger degree. Now, how do these fish perform in a, a behavioral test? For this, Jahang set up an optomotor response. So this is the kind of test that you can do with humans because you're not having to dissect eyes or anything. Um, in the fish, this is what it looks like. We have a camera. We have a screen where we control the stimulus. And the fish are in an arena. We now have a six lane arena so we can put 50 lava in each. And the camera records the position of the lava. So each of these black dots is a single five day old fish and you will see the visual stimulus playing in the background. Now, we don't have to train the fish. They will innate. This is a behavior that they do in nature because they um, come from rivers. They will swim overall in the same direction as a visual stimulus. So not every fish is doing it, but as a group, you can see that by the end of the um, stimulus that we have um, more density on the left side because the stimulus in this case is swimming to the left. And so their pre and post stimulus position can be used to, to automatically compute a normalized optomotor index. And we can see at which spatial frequency um, they perform best. So the highest is the best performance. And if they can't see the stimulus anymore, they, they won't do this behavior. So again, with the same injury model, we were able to show that the injured um, fish can see the same range but that their response is um, less than the control. We always get asked with this behavior whether the fish can still swim, because given that the genes are conserved, maybe there's a problem with the spinal cord and the swimming. So we also um, now do a swimming behavior where they're in individual wells and we flash light and or, and or darkness. You can do it in darkness or not. And we compare things like swimming distance for 10 minutes or swimming speed um, or responses to show that they can still swim. There's nothing wrong with their um, muscle innovation. And so for this part, we've been able to combine these different methods into a pipeline, and it allows us to correlate the phenotypes. So we're now using this pipeline to solve the bottleneck of identifying which of the many, many genes that come out of a human GWAS might be worth establishing models for. So when we have a, whether it's a visual disease or a neurological disease that, that has a visual phenotype, when we now say, look, there's 150 new genes, we can use our model to say, okay, these 10 really have a really bad phenotypes. It might be worth making a mouse model of. And that's exactly what one of our projects is doing. So using exactly that approach, we are screening myopia candidate genes. 
So myopia is short-sightedness where um, an image at the front is in focus, but the one further away is blurry unless you're wearing glasses, contact lenses, or have had surgery. And usually it is because the eye has grown too large compared to the optics. So the focal point of your whatever you're looking at is in front of the neurons, not on top of the neurons as it should be. So this is one phenotype is an, a bigger eye, basically. Um, the work follows a study, a human GUI study looking at children. So comparing children that are short-sighted and those that are not. This was published a couple of years ago. And everything above this line, this is a Manhattan plot showing the location on the different chromosomes. And on the left-hand side, you can see the statistical significance. So everything above these lines are individual single nucleotide polymorphisms that were identified to be significantly different between the groups. So potentially over a hundred new genes, some of which we know about, but many of which we don't know about driving um, this behavior. Now, why is this interesting? We can see a prediction that uh, the world's Population by 2050, actually half of us are predicted to have myopia. And more worryingly, almost 10% will have what's called early onset child uh, myopia, which progresses into high myopia. And even though normal myopia can be fixed by glasses, um, high myopia actually causes other severe visual diseases, including retinal detachment and blindness. So we really want both of these curves to come down but we're particularly interested in what's driving this, um, this early onset severe form. So we inject um, because this is the fastest way to do a first screening before you make a mutant. And we've decided for this to just use the behavioral screen. So with the pipeline, we can use, we can choose which um, phenotype is the most relevant for our study. We've screened, we, we have a grant to look at 40 genes. We've screened through about 25 because we didn't have much lab access due to COVID last year. Um, but even with the top 25, we already found some candidates that were really interesting. And here I'm just showing uh, the phenotype for four of them. So in black is the control. It's the same clutch from the same parents. We take half the eggs we inject and half the eggs we leave. Um, and we can see that when we knocked out some of these genes, we could see a shift in spatial frequency. And this is what you expect from myopia. The fish have trouble seeing the very fine stripes and they do match better with the bigger patterns. We also saw unexpected phenotypes, but that are very robust that we also think are worth pursuing, um, such as, for example, a reduction in the um, in the response, which was again, very significant um, in this case. So using these, we've now gone from 25, we're still gonna continue the other 15, um, but to about a handful, five or six genes that are really of interest. And we're now generating somatic CRISPR mutants where we're knocking them out just in the eye because we don't want to mess up the brain or the spinal cord, for example, and developing um, more stable mutant disease models. Jahing stayed for a PhD and he's now combining this with environmental models because myopia, even though in, it runs in families, so if your parents are short-sighted, you have a higher chance, it's actually very strongly environmental driven. So we know in many Asian um, urban cities where people live in small flats, always indoors because it's too hot outside, um, lots of reading, lots of studying, lots of TV time. The myopia has gone, is now almost 90% from a generation ago only being 30. So that's environmental driven. And we don't, we know that environmental um, induced, induces myopia, but we don't know how it interacts with the genes. And one of the environmental signals is the wavelength of light you look at. So again, being outside has been shown to be protective. And we know that the UV sunlight has a whole range of um, wavelengths. One thing we know is that different wavelengths focus different. So if you could imagine an environment where you mainly see long wavelength, perhaps the eye is growing to adjust to that, but it's now going to be too long for the green and blue short wavelength. So using the zebrafish photoreceptor sensitivity, zebrafish have four different photoreceptors to give them color vision. We can now raise them with different environments to see 
if the different wavelengths can cause or protect against myopia. Um, again, to set this model up, because we hadn't done this in the lab, we started with something that was published, which is dark rearing. And Jahin was able to show that after four weeks of rearing them in darkness, we could see a significant increase um, in the re retinal radius versus the lens radius, which is a measure of myopia. So the retina, and, and he's done this actually with a new techniques so that, I, sorry, I haven't introduced. This is a non-invasive, um, it's called OCT. Um, and it's also used in humans to, to do measurements. So light is shown into the eye and it's reflected by the different layers. So you get a readout for the anatomy without having to kill the fish or the human or without having to cut the eye open. And so retinal radius is this from the middle of the lens to the, to the end. This is the retina, this white layer here, um, and then divided by the lens radius. We couldn't just look at the length of the eye because we found that the dark reared fish are actually smaller, probably because they can't see their food because they need vision to see their food. And so as a ratio, that's how you normalize to the optics of the cell. And we could see this myopic phenotype. So he's now running a study with the um, different colors. And what we really wanna do is take some of our top candidates and see how they interact with the different environmental um, rearing conditions, because our idea is that depending on what gene risk factors you have, perhaps we could use environmental factors to counteract the risk. So if you have genes that are effective um, and make the sort of wavelength worse, perhaps we can you know, have a strategy where children look at blue light um, for half an hour in the day or something. So that's the idea. Again, the pipeline we're using for myopia. Um, we're able to identify novel candidates quite quickly. And we can now we are now using this environmental and somatic CRISPR to understand how those factors interact. The pipeline itself is obviously broadly applicable to um, other things. And Jahang, actually, I don't have time to talk about it today, also looked at a candidate gene that came out of a visual study that was related um, also to schizophrenia and autism. So moving on to the um, regenerative work, we want to know why animals like fish can regenerate neurons, but mouse and humans and other mammals cannot. Because we know developmentally the same 10 and a half thousand genes uh, are common across these species and they're obviously used to make the brain in babies so why don't humans use the same genes again in adulthood? So the model we focused on is a photoreceptor um, loss. It's a genetic model where we drive in red um, a protein, an enzyme, that when we swim the fish in a particular chemical, they all die. So these are the photoreceptors here. Um, this is a schematic. And what happens in humans, there are neurodegenerative diseases affecting photoreceptors. Um, you get activation of the same glia cells shown here in green, but they form a glial scar. So they divide and form a dense scar, but the person becomes blind. In fish, when we kill the same um, cells and we can do it like we're doing it, we can do it with light damage, we can do it genetically. Um, the Müller glia will respond also by proliferating, but then some of them, not all of them, will proliferate and regenerate the cell type we've ablated. So they know what to make. Um, they will make them in the right numbers. They connect back up and they form circuits that are functional. So we wanna know what's different between these Müller glia. Also, we wanna know what's different between the glia within the fish that stay quiet and those that actually get activated. And we want to um, follow using our model, how the glia respond. So with collaborators in China, we're looking at clonal analysis to see if the, these Müller glia, how many cell types they can make, um, how often they can divide after regeneration, if there's particular gene manipulations we can use to make them do even better. We also started using single cell RNA-seq to understand just normally if all glia are the same. Maybe there's different types, maybe humans are missing a particular type that's needed. Um, and so we want to see normally how they compare genetically. And then after we injure, which of these glia are actually responding? Do all of them respond equally? 
are there special types that are somehow able to sense the injury? And so um, without, without going through the detail, this is some data from my um, PhD student, Aaron, where here we can see in the control, we have um, photoreceptors. After our treatment with the chemical called metronidazole, these die over the first couple of days. And we can see that some of the debris is phagocytosed by the Müller glia. So we also get immune cells coming in and he's looking at that now, that phagocytose dead cells to clean it up. But we also see this debris in our green stem cells. So we thought maybe eating up the debris is one of the signals that allows zebrafish Müller glia to say, ah, an injury has happened. And so he started quantifying correlating phagocytosis and proliferation. And he was able to show that to, uh, 48, 54, and 72 hours after injury, um, if you're looking at the total Müller glia that have phagocytose and those that are proliferating, we're starting to see a trend. In the ones that are proliferating, or we call it activated, they are more likely to have phagocytose. Now, this data tells us that not all of the activating ones phagocytose, so it's not the only signal. It also tells us that phagocytosing itself is not enough to make uh, the cells activate. So we now think it's an important signal, but it acts with other things. But this is again some examples of how we can use um, the anatomy and some processes, and we're also hoping to do some live imaging to see what happens when a stem cell phagocytosis, is it more likely then to proliferate. This is single cell RNA-seq data from our um, collaborators, where we can start looking at the different clusters. So for example, highlighted here are proliferative clusters after injury. So if we look at these two clusters, we know these are, sorry, these are uh, facts sorted to only include the green cells. So these are all mulaglia, but after injury, we can see that some of them um, are proliferating. They're expressing the proliferative cell nuclear um, activating factor cell cycle factors, and one of the key regenerative um, genes that, that we have found. So if we look here at cluster one, it expresses all of these genes. We can then go back to cluster one. We know that's the activated one. And we can ask what else does it express? What else is involved in regeneration um, that we don't know yet? And do humans have this? And can we overexpress this in first the mouse model? So we're identifying cellular process um, that drive activation, and we're using strategies to find more of the gene networks um, that are involved to then see in a mouse model if we can activate them. Can we fool them into thinking they phagocytose something, for example? And finally, um, just to finish off, I want to talk about Pauline's um, project, and, and she would be much more knowledgeable to explain this to you. So I'll give you, I'll give you my limited understanding. But Pauline came to the lab um, from Cesar's lab, and she has uh, established her own research program that she's termed Australian Antioxidants for Visual Disorders, so AVID, with the idea that we can use some untapped resources in our country here in Australia to find new botanical plants that might be beneficial for human health with a focus on the visual system. For the start, we've uh, started looking at glaucoma. This is a disease where um, eventually you start losing vision in the periphery and then it gets smaller and smaller until patients are actually blind. It has a lot of risk factors such as age and gender. The main one is intraocular pressure. Um, however, this is not the only one. We also know that there's genetic risk factors and we know that there are people that have glaucoma that don't have uh, raised intraocular pressure as well as people with intraocular pressure that is high but they don't develop glaucoma. So they might have a different genetic makeup that's protective. In any case, um, what's common in glaucoma is that the ganglion cells, which are the ones that form the optic nerve, um, start dying. And part of that with the pressure is that there's high pressure where the axons leave the eye. The way they die is through oxidative stress. And this is common depending regardless of the risk factors. And so the idea of Pauline's project is to identify antioxidants, use them in models of visual disorders, try to improve mitochondrial function and reduce oxidative stress, 
and see if we can then protect or repair some of the damage. And we also want to know how exactly the treatment um, affects the ganglion cells. Is it just survival because the oxidative um, stress is down or is it also activating protective gene expression? The approach for this, again, I'll be very brief today, um, is that we have collaborators that are looking at different botanical standards. We're starting with antioxidant standards that are known and also now moving into botanicals that are um, anticipated to have different antioxidants to identify the active ingredients and how much there is. Uh, we now have two students working on the project and one of them has a focused on looking at toxicology, so identifying which concentration will be the, the best to use. So obviously if all fish die, um, that's too high, but we wanna get as high as we can for the next step. And then, so here's um, some, just some brief data on the standards that, that have been established. So looking at different concentrations here for different antioxidant standards, uh, the students are looking at pheno phenotypic uh, changes every day. So from one from the first day of treatment till the fourth day when the study finishes, this is showing you the four day results. Um, but every day, every uh, single embryo is scored for obviously mortality, but also some of the more subtle toxic um, phenotypes. So we can see that in all cases, um, we do get an increase in, in some of these with increasing concentrations. But again, interestingly, different antioxidants seem to affect the fish differently. We see here with ascorbic acid, vitamin C, it looks like it gets um, better, but what's actually happening at the higher concentration is that the mortality is high. So when the mortality is high, the ones that are surviving don't have so much of a phenotype. The next step, um, this is the bit that's getting really exciting, is that we're using a hydrogen peroxide um, protocol to induce oxidative stress. And we have a chemical dye in which embryos under high oxidative stress will fluoresce. So they can then go into a spectrophotometer, we can take pictures of these, and we can assess um, how high the oxidative stress is. And we can add our antioxidants to ask, can we lower the oxidative stress? This is just, this is very preliminary. Again, our lab access, unfortunately, has been very limited. This is just a control without embryos just to see that antioxidants are working where we can have the hydrogen peroxide with the dye and that's giving us a high fluorescence because it's high stress and we can show that different concentration of some of these standards are able to reduce that and we're currently doing the studies now obviously with the fish but we unfortunately don't have um, all of the data yet. So just to sum up where we're going, we've been trying for the last 10 months to get fish sent from the US. Um, flights are sparse and apparently now in summer it's too hot to send them, but there are two mutants that model glaucoma. So one of them is called bug eye, and you can see that it has this high intraocular pressure. It also has ganglion cell. And we want to treat these mutants um, with the concentration that we find from the hydrogen peroxide test to be effective in reducing oxidative stress without causing any of the toxic phenotypes, of course, and to see if we can increase uh, cell survival, reduce oxidative stress, and if we change gene expression. And once we have candidates, so we're looking now at, I believe it's six native plants um, that we're taking through the, that, that a second student's working on, then um, the next step is we have collaborators in the building next door that have a rat model of glaucoma where they do a half suture, which increases the pressure of the eye and these um, over eight weeks develop glaucoma. And we want to treat them with, uh, with, with the antioxidants we find. And so again, we're focusing on glaucoma, but of course there's many neurodegenerative diseases, including visual diseases that are caused by um, oxidative stress. And so using the high throughput screening capacity we, can, capacity, we can again narrow down pretty quickly which compounds are not going to um, be effective. We're really interested in these botanicals that have a different combination of standards because we think that they might actually have a better effect than just using individual um, standards. 
And if we can find these, then of course, uh, this would be useful for any neurodegenerative disorder or other disorders that are caused by oxidative stress. And we're excited with our collaborators to then test mammalian models. And hopefully if we find something promising, uh, I know Pauline in the future is also very interested in then testing delivery strategies towards translation. So whether that's eye drop, whether that's using nanotechnology, whether that's um, an intravitreal injection. Um, so that, that's for the future. So I just wanna finish, sorry, I don't have my timer up, so I hope it's been okay. Um, but the team, we've been doing Zoom meetings for a long time um, and the collaborators. So from Melbourne Uni for the pipeline, our Chinese collaborators for the regeneration, um, the team in, at the University of Western Australia that approached us uh, and got some, we got some funding together to do the myopia screening. So they are mainly human um, geneticists and the new team working on AVID. And I thank you for your attention. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for your nice talk. Very interesting. We have seen that using a zebrafish as model, you can do everything you want. <laughs> Especially <Almost. laughs> under, under ethical concern, you can do everything you want. People are working with zebrafish around the world in different research line. Thank you for your talk. Now uh, it's open for questions. And uh, you have many students following your talk. And uh, now it's open for questions, please. So Pauline, what a beautiful lecture. Uh, the images are amazing, amazing. <laughs> and our students have, have done some uh, questions, but uh, the first one is a general one. It's uh, from Leonardo Ferreira. Uh, what are the major concerns about using these models? Do you have any problem or test to overcome? Uh, I know that when we talk, we talk about benefits, but what are the difficulties of, of using this? Um, so one thing that comes up is that not everything will be translatable to mammals. In the nervous system, it's pretty well defined. So obviously if you're studying something like ovary development, you can't use a fish, um, but there are obviously differences. So when we say that those 10 and a half thousand genes are conserved, the sequence is more different than a mouse. Um, so there could be changes where you have a single nucleotide change in a human and a mouse that doesn't exist in the zebrafish. So some of the genome-wide association studies, we won't, we will miss a gene that's important because in the zebrafish, it doesn't do that. The other thing that people often say, um, which I don't necessarily think, I think you just need to be aware of the limitations, is that zebrafish have undergone, or, or the, um, that clade of animals has undergone a genome duplication. So where humans and mouse only have one gene, sometimes, not all the time, we have two. It means that if you're making a mutant and you're only knocking out one, you might not see the phenotype. So you just have to make sure you approach two. The benefit of it is that sometimes the two have slightly different expression. So we have found some genes where one is in the brain and one is in the eye, for example, or one is developmental and one is an adult. And it means that by knocking out one, we have a live fish that just has the development missing or just the eye. Whereas sometimes if you knock out that same gene in the mouse, the mouse dies because it's important for the brain development. Um, mm. So you've got to be aware and yeah, but for some genes, it becomes tricky. Okay. So Sadhu, do you want to, to make one? Yeah, uh, Patricia, there is some disease that cause uh, retina degeneration. Is there uh, some focus in your studies uh, on retina regeneration? We don't have degeneration models. Actually, that's another limitation that, that you just reminded me of. 
Some of the processes are hard to study because fish regenerate. So to make a degenerative model, the stem cells will keep trying to make the cells. So it becomes a little bit more complex. So you can't follow the degeneration that you see in mouse. So for example, um, one of the labs we share lab meetings with, they will have a mouse model and they follow how after the photoreceptors die, what happens to the synapses, what happens to the next cell. They try to make new synapses. That doesn't happen in fish because they will regenerate the cells. Um, so I haven't started with any neurodegenerative models, um, but that's something very important because the fact that in humans and mouse, the cells are normally developed in development and then after you know 30 years they die, means that if the fish can keep regenerating quick enough, it probably won't have the same phenotype. Okay. Thank you. So I was wondering, by, uh, that's a question by me. Uh, these diseases are uh, related to eldred of the population, like glaucoma and uh, problems in the retine and so on. Uh, can you put time in these uh, experiments? Because uh, uh, that's the problem that we got in our population. So can you put time uh, somehow in these models? You can. So there are models that are quick. The two mutants we're getting in, one has that phenotype of glaucoma um, early on. I can't remember the days, but I think before 10 days. So quite early, maybe even four or five. The other one only develops it at four months. Um, so we have some models. And again, with, with genes, instead of knocking them out, if you just change the promoter or transcription factor binding, you can make it that there's less of it. So it's okay for a few months. Um, for the work we do, we like things fast. We don't like waiting four months, um, especially, and it's with treatments, it becomes hard because they're in a water flow and we can't keep adding the chemicals to the system. So um, yeah, but, but you, you, you can certainly at, at time. And we know with regeneration, if you poke the eye at one month, three months or 12 months, the 12 month eye takes longer to heal. So when you do the behavioral test, instead of after two weeks, they take maybe six weeks. Um, so they do get worse as well. Okay. So Sasa, do you want to- More questions? Uh -huh. We have lots of them. <laughs> um, uh, students are interested in the myopia, uh, myopia uh, model. They are wondering how do you, did you choose uh, the phenotype that you want to study? Uh, they didn't understand a little bit the, the, that okay. model when you, you you make the choice, you know? The choice it's, of the disease or the choice of the phenotype? The phenotype, the phenotype. Okay. The reason we chose the behavioral, we're actually doing two. Our collaborators are also looking at the eye size. The reason we chose the behavioral one is because the screening is very quick. Instead of cutting and sectioning hundreds, we have four lanes of mutants, so 200 fish, and two lanes of controls. And we set it up, we meaning the students, I actually don't do much work. Um, we set it up, the stimulus runs for two hours, and then we have the data. Um, the data takes quite a long time to analyze, but it means that within a week, you could get through these very quickly without doing a lot of histology or microscopy. Okay. So, uh, Cesar, do you want to do the next one from Mateus, or can I do? <laughs> uh, the question of a student asking is, uh, how is the guarantee when you translate your results uh, obtained in the zebra fish from humans? Sorry, what how was the first bit? How is the... Yeah, when I when when I have a, your, your results in zebrafish, how is your guarantee of to, when they are uh, to <laughs> trans? Can you trans guarantee that it's translated to humans or mammals? Humans. The quick answer is we can't. We cross our fingers and hope. Um, a lot of the genes, as I said, they do the same thing in development. 
And so from the spinal cord study, I can tell you, for example, that um, we found that zebra fish release fibroblast growth factor, FGF, and humans and mice don't. And the glia, instead of forming a scar, they formed glial bridges and the nerve cells regenerated across the spinal cord. When you put human FGF on human cells, they do the same. When you inject human FGF into the mouse spinal cord thing, it regenerates a little bit, not the whole way. Um, so again, it gives us evidence that genes that are very conserved, like growth factors, probably have the same role. And we could see that in, in mouse, usually it's not upregulated, but in fish it is. Um, FGF is an interesting one because before our study, it's actually already being injected into humans with spinal cord um, uh, surfing accidents, car accidents, but they don't know why it works. So that's where, where, where we use the fish study. Our fish study also showed that you have to do it straight away. What happens in the human studies is that after four or five years of trying rehabilitation, nothing works, the people sign up. It actually needs to be like if we do it in the fish after a delay, it doesn't work anymore. Um, in humans so far, the best studies have shown that you get an extra centimeter. So they're not gonna walk, but it might mean they can go to the toilet by themselves. It might mean they can breathe by themselves. Um, so for human, yeah, still a long way to go, but it gives us some hope, no guarantee, but some hope that, that it's translatable. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. I, I think yeah. it's becoming late for you in Australia. Uh, I would ask for one more question because uh, I, I imagine it's too late in Australia. It's okay. And, uh, thank you for your talk. I'm happy to see your talk. And uh, one more question. Uh, if people have more questions, please I, I use, do. Your, I use, do. Your, use, your, use your email. You. Because it's too late in Australia. And one more question. And another question by email, please. I do, I do have just a little bit, just one. Um, you talk about some uh, environmental uh, driven problems. Uh, have you studied some epigenetics uh, modifications? Because uh, it, it trains us to, to, to investigate this. Is there anything about this? kind of modification in the gene and gene expression driven by epigenetic modification? I would suspect so. I haven't done anything um, yeah. like that. Okay. But that's yeah. certainly, I mean, it has, it has to be, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the environmental factors will be. Okay. Okay. So as, as has it told, uh, it's too, too late in Australia. We had a lot of questions here. I think more than 10, <laughs> but uh, if it's great it was... to see the students so active, sometimes they're a little bit, uh... so thank you for listening and for asking really good questions. So uh, I, I, I will talk a little bit in Portuguese. Uh, pessoal, as, as perguntas que não foram respondidas, vocês podem mandar para a gente, a gente vai direcionar para a doutora Patrícia, tá bom? Sem nenhum problema. Ou mesmo a Pauline, ou mesmo a Pauline pode ajudar a responder. Ou a Pauline, né? Uh, so uh, we will send to you the questions somehow in, in, by email if, if you can or Pauline can uh, uh, help them to, to answer. So thank you very much. It was for us a uh, very good morning to see so many beautiful images and uh, a very well done work in some huge problems that we got in our population. Thank you very much, Patricia. It was very Thank nice. you so much for having Thank me. You. Thank you for giving your time for us.